Well, hello, hello everyone. This is the uh, live streaming channel of the Blackheath Philosophy Forum. Uh, if you've been following our activities over the years, you'd know we, until this year, we've uh, held our meetings in a windy municipal hall, but uh, now because of COVID, we're um, streaming online and it's actually quite enjoyable. So uh, this is uh, the next of a series of 12 talks that uh, address in different ways the issues the potential challenges to free speech in the liberal order. And so we've had a variety of viewpoints and a variety of perspectives. And um, today we'll be uh, looking specifically at the role of the information revolution and its impact on free speech and democratic deliberation. But uh, our speaker today is going to cover various aspects of that, including the potential role of social media, artificial intelligence, and so forth. Are these new technologies improving or impoverishing uh, democratic debate? So with that, I'd like to welcome our speaker today, um, Professor Duncan Iverson. Uh, Duncan is the Professor of Political Philosophy at the University of Sydney, and he's also the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney. So we've got a very distinguished guest today. And um, Duncan has also been a, a very consistent supporter of the Philosophy Forum over the years. He's uh, done two previous talks when we were in physical mode. So we're very pleased to welcome him back uh, to speak on this topic today. The format for today is a relatively short introductory presentation by Professor Duncan, which will go for perhaps 20 minutes. Um, that'll be followed by some follow-up questions that I'll ask. And uh, then we'll uh, get respond to some of the your, your the audience comments and queries posted in the chat window. Uh, please keep everything relevant, concise and polite. Um, and then we plan to finish about um, 5.15, round about then. So with that, I'll give the floor to Professor Duncan Iverson. Welcome, well, Professor Iverson. Thanks, Peter. And it's great uh, to be back, if not in Blackheath, with you online at least. Um, I've always really enjoyed uh, the, the forum, so it's great to reconnect with you all. Um, and uh, I should say that this is a topic which uh, I've really just been starting to think about uh, over the last uh, six months or eight months. I mean, obviously it's in the air. And we're all wondering what the impact of the digital revolution we're living through uh, will be on, on, on the culture more generally. But I guess I've been thinking about it in relation to liberal democracy in particular. So I'm just gonna sort of lay out a few questions, a few, uh, I guess, problems, and hopefully provoke some discussion and, and, and questions. So I'll keep it relatively brief. Um, so does the rise of digital technology and especially social media, I'm going to be concentrating mainly on social media this afternoon, and hopefully you'll see why in a minute, and especially the business models and the power held by large technology companies that drive the platforms that social media sort of rest on, do these present a special kind of challenge to liberal democracy today? Um, and more specifically, does it present a special kind of challenge to freedom of speech? So I'm going to be quite narrow in my focus. I mean, obviously, the topic of technology and liberal democracy is a rich one. It goes back um, uh, quite a way. But I'm going to focus very specifically on uh, the impact on liberal democracy and more specifically on the impact on freedom of speech. And I guess one question I'm asking is, you know, do our canonical justifications and understandings of freedom of speech um, give us adequate conceptual and, and sort of moral firepower to equip us to deal with these challenges. And I guess my intuition is, my hunch is, is that I'm really beginning to question whether they do. I'm really beginning to question whether our kind of exist, the existing way we think about freedom of speech really is adequate to our times. Happy to be proven wrong today, but that's my hunch. So it's great for me to be able to test this out in you. And I'm actually thinking, I'm actually increasing of the view that these are much greater challenges, these challenges to freedom of speech that I think are presented by these new digital technologies 
than many of the more sort of fashionable concerns with with identity politics and stuff like that. So I guess my goal is to try and persuade you of that um, this afternoon. Now, as I said, the problem of new technology and its impact on liberal democracy goes back a long way, but the problem of new technology and its impact on speech in particular, of course, is uh, an ancient one. I mean, Socrates, after all, distrusted the written word. He thought it enabled a kind of deceptive form of communication since it separated, if you remember, the speaker, the author, from the context and thus content um, from action. For Socrates, the reader lacked access to the tone, the gesture, the expression of the speaker, and that was crucial, he thought, to judging their trustworthiness. And this ability to judge the trustworthiness of information is, for me, I think, one of the key things we need to focus on this afternoon in thinking about the impact of technology on our public discourse. Socrates ultimately was concerned with the extent to which speech became mediated through other forms. And of course, his student, Plato, banished the poet, poets from the Calipolis. He too was concerned about mediation. In this case, he was concerned about you know, the imitative nature of poetry and its potential to sort of distract and disrupt the guardians from developing the character traits that they needed to rule well. Now, of course, with the modern age, and like I said, this is a short, uh, hopefully snappy talk, so I'm leaping great bounds. With the modern age came a whole raft of, of new modes of mediated speech, but also a whole raft of regulatory and cultural structures that helped readers and listeners understand what was being said, or at least help people to judge whether what they were hearing, reading, watching was trustworthy, accurate, uh, or uh, sincere. By that I mean there arose a whole range of structured intermediaries, authors, editors, publishers, printers, regulators, intellectual property regimes, legal regimes of defamation, broadcasting, film guidelines and regulations, to hold those who were expressing themselves to account. And to a certain extent, sat alongside, obviously, the court of public opinion and that hallowed idea of the free market of ideas. Now, none of that worked perfectly, but there was certainly an emergent infrastructure for our public sphere. Think of you know, someone like Habermas's work on the structural transformation of the public sphere here. Okay, so what has changed? What is new? about the rise of social media. If this problem of mediated speech goes back at least to the ancient Greeks, then what's new about the rise of social media and the new digital platforms? And this is, you know, at first I thought, well, look, this is just a variation on an old problem. We've got some good, you know, philosophical concepts and arguments we can draw on. Um, but the more I've sort of been reading around and thinking about it, the more I increasingly am a bit more pessimistic. Now, one, I'm just going to take a few minutes very briefly to, to give you some, some, some insight on this from some of the political science that's been written on this topic. And one prominent expert in this field is a Canadian political scientist, uh, typically, uh, Ronald Debert. And uh, Ronald Debert's done some really interesting work on this question. He, he's looking at it from a political science perspective, not necessarily a philosophical perspective. And by the way, he's giving the um, 2020 Massey Lectures on CBC Radio this year, if you're interested. And of course, people like Charles Taylor, Michael Ignatiev, a whole range of philosophers have given these lectures in the past. So I, I, you might want to tune in when they're online. Now, Debert has identified what he calls three painful truths about social media. And the more I thought about them, the more I think they are genuine conundrums for someone who's thinking about the nature of liberal democratic public discourse. So the first painful truth is that the social media business model is based on deep and relentless surveillance of our personal data, which is used to target information, advertisements, ideology back at us. So the first painful truth of social media is that it's grounded in a kind of relentless surveillance that is then played back to us. The second painful truth is that we actually permit this staggering level of surveillance willingly. We sign up to it. 
even if we don't realize we're signing up to it. So we permit this staggering level of surveillance willingly, if not altogether wittingly. And third, that far from being incompatible uh, with authoritarianism and authoritarian tendencies in our culture, which many people, you know, the internet age was supposed to be this great freedom liberating um, time, far from being incompatible with authoritarianism, it's proving to be amongst the most effective enablers of it globally and socially. So those are the three painful truths of social media. Now, why is this the case? Why, why is this happening? And we don't really have time to go into this in detail. I'm not, I'm not sufficiently expert in the social science of this, but, and there's been some wonderfully rich work done, uh, aside from Debert, uh, some of you might be aware of Shoshana Zuboff's The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. It's a terrific, terrific read, by the way, if you haven't um, seen it yet. But one thing I do want to highlight here, just before we move on to some of the philosophical issues, is the underlying, as I said, business model of the large tech companies. Now, through, through obscure and, and reasonably covert means, they collect and then sell data that we willingly share with them, that they then sell to others, who then use this information to sell us things according to the preferences and desires we've revealed in our social media habits. Now, just hang on to that because I'm going to come back to, I think, what the, what the sort of uh, almost moral consequences of this are. These companies then spend enormous amounts of money on building what the social scientists call compulsion loops that sort of see us developing a, a kind of addiction to likes and followers and notifications and all the paraphernalia that comes with social media. And they do this in a way at the same time that obscures the way it actually works. You know, think of the metaphor of the cloud to begin with. I mean, what, what is the cloud? It's layers and layers of algorithms hid, hidden in tiny mi microprocessors, networked in the sensors, fed in the data processing warehouses, which in turn are in some cases literally buried beneath mountains and sequestered behind fences. The whole enterprise is hidden, literally and then figuratively through intellectual property laws and non-disclosure agreements. Okay, so what does this have to do with liberal democracy and free speech in particular? Well, remember a minute ago I talked about the important role of intermediaries in civil society, of authors, editors, publishers, printers, legal institutions, regulatory regimes. Liberal democracies, both, you know, we know this both from the history of liberal democracy, but uh, in, its, in, in its development. Liberal democracies depend on these intermediaries to manage, and discipline, and curate the content that readers and listeners and citizens engage with. As the British philosopher Honora O'Neill has put it, they help people judge others' trustworthiness, as well as their claims and actions. Remember a minute ago, I said this is a really important idea. How are we able, our ability to judge others' trustworthiness is a critical feature of civil society. It's a critical feature of a functioning public sphere. These intermediaries provide what, what I'll call, and it's, it's a bit of a mouthful, but just bear with me, I'll call the infrastructure of public reason. It enables public reason to, 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 to happen um, effectively. Now, this is what I think is breaking down in this social media age. As I pointed out, and as Debert and others have, have made clear, the business model of technology companies accelerates deception and disinformation. It enables the targeting of individuals and groups with misleading and manipulative information. It encourages extreme and emotionally charged responses. Given the overload of information we get, and thus the cognitive shortcuts, as, as the psychologists call it, we take, we inevitably take to cope with it. You know, there's a fascinating paper in Science last year, the, the journal Science, that demonstrated that, uh, and let me get this right, that falsehoods um, become more credible 
the more you're exposed to them because seemingly they're more novel and thus they spread more easily. The, the, the spread increases the more you're exposed to them. They also become embedded more quickly in this environment and therefore they're harder to dislodge through our kind of traditional mechanisms. And as I've said, this is all done anonymously, you know, behind sequestered in mountaintops and behind uh, chain link fences. And yet it's orchestrated as well because the business model requires that it be orchestrated to generate the uh, profit that these companies um, are able so spectacularly to generate. And what's happening is that our ability to make judgments of truth, trustworthiness and untrustworthiness are just harder and harder to make. And at the extreme end, I'm not necessarily saying this necessarily happens, but at the extreme end, this is also exactly the features that many uh, authoritarian regimes and authoritarian elements of our culture actually trade on. Um, the Oxford Internet Institute did a study that found that at least something like 50 countries have government agencies or political parties engaging in shaping public opinion through social media. That, I mean, that's their kind of raison d'etre. Now, even more interestingly, we don't have to assume that there's some evil genius directing all of this misinformation across social media platforms. We don't have to assume it's a kind of coordinated plot against democracy. In many cases, it's just the opportunism that emerges and is driven by that underlying business model, which the internet can, can kind of viralize in powerful ways. Um, a colleague told me that one of the most popular fraudulent news stories in the 2016 election in the United States apparently was the story about the Pope endorsing Trump. And apparently this was made up by a bunch of teenagers in Macedonia. So we don't, you know, we don't need to, we don't need to think there's Putin is behind everything. Uh, but in some ways this just confirms how dangerous uh, social media can be, I think, for um, democracy. So here's the punchline. If there's, if there's one sentence you remember from, from, from this talk this afternoon, this is probably really what I'm trying to figure out for myself. I think the public harm of these digital technologies, let's set aside the private harm that might be occurring. I think the public harm of these digital technologies is that it works to undermine the infrastructure of public reason that's necessary for liberal democracy to function well. So in a sense, that's my, that's my kind of fundamental claim. The, the public harm of these digital technologies is that it undermines the infrastructure of public reason. It, it, it's undermining the intermediary structures. And more importantly, and I'll get to this in a second, those social norms that sit around our uh, ability to communicate effectively with each other, including our ability to speak freely in uh, various ways that liberals value and uh, expect. Okay, so let me let me try and and um, play this out a bit a bit further. So, what then are the consequences for thinking about the nature of free speech um, in a liberal democracy, given the rise of these digital technologies and the overwhelming power of these? Um, that underlying business model driven by those tech companies. And of course, as we know, Facebook and Twitter feed off the value, that liberal value of free speech, and indeed often justify their business model with reference to the importance of free speech and them being a powerful vehicle for their users uh, to express themselves in ways they couldn't through more traditional media and the gatekeepers that that traditional media uh, tended to, to have in place. And, and this was part of, I guess, the early optimism and still relevant optimism that people had about these media platforms, that it would kind of liberate people from, from having to be lectured to by the New York Times or um, the City Morning Herald or, or whatever. Now, I think 
along with some of the political scientists, I think there are really serious problems with this argument. And I actually think the challenges the business models of the tech companies pre present us are, I think, increasingly, and I could be wrong about this, so I'm happy to be dissuaded. In some ways, it would be good to be dissuaded of this. Um, I actually think they're among the most serious facing our conceptions and practices of public reason and free speech and liberal democracy, especially if you look at what's happening in the world around us today, whether it's in the United States or in Europe uh, or in our neighborhood. Now, I think the best argument for freedom of speech uh, is essentially an instrumental one along the lines of the classic million case for free speech, right? And you've had a number of talks about this this year, so I'm not gonna belabor it, but let me just say a tiny bit about this. So free speech you know, is valuable because it enables us to express ourselves in ways that secures our dignity, or for Mill, our individuality. It, it enables us to ensure that we don't get sort of soaked in intellectual pacification, as, as he put it in that wonderful essay, which means being committed to the pursuit of truth, or at least to pursuing um, a better answer along with contributing to the grounds, uh, to the liberal grounds uh, for the legitimacy of any political authority that is exercised over us. So the limits of free speech, of course, need to be calibrated in light of these ends. And, and classically for Mill, uh, speech should only be limited if it harms others, where harm, that concept of harm is closely related the invasion of the rights of others. Of course, Mill had a complex conception of rights as well, which you don't have time to get into here. Um, and much of the action in the political philosophy of liberal free speech then has been in determining what we think the nature of the kind, these kinds of harms are. You've already had some wonderful talks this year on this, looking at your program. Is pornography, hate speech, other forms of offensive behavior or beliefs rightfully constrained according to the harm principle? And to what extent should freedom of expression be balanced against other liberal values, such as equality and the expression of equal concern and respect for all citizens? These are all you know, the, the standard, difficult, important debates about the nature of free speech. I think the case of social media and big tech though, presents an even more foundational issue for us here. I actually think this issue about the degradation of the infrastructure of public reason is actually getting at something even more foundational than our debates about the nature of the limits to free speech or whether or not free speech can be limited for issues like uh, the harms caused by pornography or hate speech. The risk is, I think, that these technologies, and more importantly, the behaviors and beliefs they're reinforcing, are undermining the very infrastructure of public reason upon which the value of free speech is premised in the first place. If citizens no longer care about being able to accurately judge what is true or trustworthy, or worse, are not able to, because the various intermediaries required for that are now absent, or seriously compromised, then is the very possibility of public reason that is oriented towards the truth somehow undermined? And you know, what would we have to change in order to address that challenge? Now, there's obviously really all kinds of serious and important regulatory issues here that we could talk about, and I'm not really qualified to talk about them in detail. So instead, I just want to finish by saying a, a, just with a few thoughts about where I think the breakdown seems most acute from the perspective of, I guess, liberal values. So the focus in debates on freedom of speech is not surprisingly on the fundamental rights of freedom of expression or of privacy or personal autonomy. However, and, and again, this is sort of speculative, I think um, the problems I'm, I'm trying to outline here 
are very much in the realm of the undermining of powerful social norms and institutions in which people and agencies are expected to behave in ways that express the duties that we have towards others and ones that are not often captured in our theories of rights. For example, the duties of truthfulness, honesty, sincerity, civility, and generosity. And of course, this touches on a, a big issue in political philosophy that a number of philosophers over the years have been, have been uh, I think, uh, pushing, such as Honor O'Neill, Bernard Williams, and others, that these duties have a tendency to become invisible when rights are presented as the only frame of reference in our public discourse. And it's precisely these social norms that surround our free speech, that surround our, our claim right to free speech that are breaking down in the current context. These are, uh, you know, what uh, early modern philosophers called imperfect duties in that they lack any direct counterpart to a right. And they include duties that can't necessarily even be enforced through public law or public authority more generally. And yet I think they're kind of critical to the infrastructure of public reason. The anonymity of social media means that there's very little accountability for the falsehoods or claims made by many contributors to public speech today. And the protected anonymity of the system means there's very little recourse to enforcing any accountability for those who provide the platforms upon which these false claims are often made. So there's no consequences for bad faith participation in public debate. The pursuit of truth or rightness, whatever you want to call it, is not being enhanced by the free flow of ideas. Citizens are not able to test their ideas against others as they develop their projects, goals, and conceptions of the good. So in order to counteract these tendencies, we'll need to place our conceptions of freedom of speech and expression in the context of a public sphere that is being transformed by technology. Here's, I guess, where I think our, our standard arguments are lacking somewhat. And this will require us to balance this freedom against other values, and especially the preservation of the necessary conditions required for there to be an effective form of public discourse in the first place. And practically speaking, that means regulating and potentially restricting forms of expression that are currently enabled by these digital platforms, as well as the business models that drive them. Okay, last, last point. I shouldn't end on such a pessimistic note. We shouldn't accept that technology, we shouldn't accept a kind of technological determinism here, um, as some of the political scientists uh, above tend to do. Incredibly powerful machines remain just that, machines, at least for now, until we get full AI, I guess. The key will be to develop ways to exert democratic control of, over them, as well as the people who currently own them. You know, AI can now detect breast cancer more quickly than many radiographers. Machine learning is helping us to reduce emissions in many of our power systems. But we need to ensure that our imagination is not limited to the kinds of problems machines can solve but rather that technology is harnessed for democratic ends and to address the problems we care uh, most about. Okay, I'll stop there. Hey, thank you. Um, thanks, that was a very good, uh, very helpful uh, introduction to the discussion. So uh, thank you, Duncan. Um, just um, one aspect of it that, um, of, of the climate that exists at the moment about public debate on contentious issues uh, is the there's, there's a very real fear factor that seems to have been emerged in, in the age of social media. I mean, because, you know, we've seen the possibility of the creation of digital mobs, particularly on Twitter, that are literally able to destroy reputations virtually overnight. There was a, a classic example of that uh, couple of years ago that in, involved uh, somebody called Sir Timothy Hunt, who's a molecular biologist, in fact, a very distinguished one, had a knighthood and everything. Um, he, he received the 2003, I think it was, Nobel Prize for Medicine for his work in molecular biology. And uh, he addressed a, a conference of um, women science 
science, uh, science journalists in Seoul, South Korea. And in the course of that, he made a, a couple of sort of fairly feeble jokes about women in the laboratory. He said, you know, trouble with women in the laboratory is sometimes they start crying and then you, and the other problem is sometimes you fall in love with them and etc. And then having said that, made those observations, he then said, but don't take any notice of me. I'm a silly old codger. It is terribly important that uh, you young women get involved in, in science and uh, I, I strongly encourage it. Now, what happened after that was that one of the um, journalists at this conference took the first part of what he said, i.e., you know, the, the sort of feeble joke part, uh, and tweeted it, omitting the final part where he emphatically states that uh, it's important that uh, women get involved in science, so they have a crucial contribution to make. But literally, this just went viral on Twitter, and literally while he was flying home from Seoul back to London, his career was destroyed. This is a, a person of extraordinary distinction. He, his, uni, his university, which is uh, University College London, I think it was, um, withdrew his uh, emeritus professorship. The, um, uh, the European Research Council, which he played a role in founding, um, disavowed him. Even the Royal Society, uh, which he was a member of, washed their hands of him. And his career was literally over, but through the actions of a Twitter mob within within 48 hours. Uh, I mean, and the fact that this can happen, this, I mean, he wasn't stating a, if you like, a political position or a position on a contentious issue, but he was you know, exhibiting, I suppose, a mindset that, you know, that the, all the, the natural factors that might produce mob hysteria is a, a sort of magnified and multiplied and accelerated by, by the availability of social media. So it can happen literally globally overnight. And um, I think this is this is casting a, a real shadow over the possibility of um, rational debate on any issue which engages with, you know, the politics of identity or, you know, a, a range of particular things. The um, well-known um, neuroscientist and podcaster and video uh, blogger Sam Harris, who most people have heard of, actually did a blog, uh, a podcast about this. I'll just read what he said. It's actually very interesting. Quote, I think social media is a huge part of the problem. I've been saying for a few years now that with social media, we've all been enrolled in a psychological experiment for which no one gave consent, and it's not at all clear how it will turn out. And it's not clear how it will, but it's not looking good. It's fairly disorienting out there. All information is becoming weaponized. All communication is becoming performative. And on the most important topics, it now seems to be fury and sanctimony and bad faith almost all the time. We appear to be driving ourselves crazy, actually crazy, as in incapable of coming into contact with reality, unable to distinguish fact from fiction, and then becoming totally destabilized by our own powers of imagination and confirmation bias and then lashing out at one another on that basis. I've been watching our country, and this is in the context of the Black Lives Matter upsurge after George Floyd. I've been watching our country seem to tear itself apart for weeks now and perhaps lay the ground for much worse to come. And I've been resisting the temptation to say anything of substance, not because I don't have anything to say, but my because of my perception of the danger, frankly, and if that's the way I feel, given the pains that I've taken to insulate myself from those concerns, I know that almost everyone with a public platform is terrified. Journalists, editors, executives and celebrities are terrified that they might make one wrong step, wrong step here and never recover. So that's, that's, that's what he had to say. Now, bear in mind, Max Harris is not some right wing figure. In fact, he goes to pains in this podcast to uh, express how much he loathes Donald Trump and, and, and hopes, you know, yearns for his electoral defeat. But what, what he's in effect saying is if you take an issue like Black Lives Matter, um, if you try to raise some nuance, for example, you might concede that there was a terrible crime that was done to George Floyd. And you might concede that racism and some racism in the police force is, a, is an ongoing problem. But it's clear what he would like to be able to say freely is that the, the pattern of activism that's emerged in the wake of that event 
is not necessarily conducive of improved, to improving things. So uh, I wonder if you'd comment on that, that, uh, yeah. you know, Look, the way that uh, these media have created a, a kind of a reign of terror uh, in some cases that preclude people from speaking honestly. Yeah, look, there's a whole range of issues there, and I might only pick a couple of them. I mean, and this is what I find quite, I guess, uh, challenging for me, because uh, I, I really do think there is something distinctive about the, the challenge that social media presents. Of course, all technology can be used for good and ill. Um, there are very good things that happen, like this event today, for example. It's facilitated and enabled by some of the very companies and platforms I've been sort of worrying about in the talk. So it's not to say it's all horrible uh, and whatnot. But I do think, I mean, you know, the, the particular examples are interesting ones. I mean, I do think uh, if you are a Nobel Prize winner, uh, you, need to, you, you need to be alert to the, the, the power that your words have. So I won't comment on Tim Hunt in particular, but I think I do agree with you that this acceleration of um, uh, of the the ability of 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 people to kind of cue off of fairly uh, simplistic claims and the lack of there to be any sort of nuance to the discussion on these platforms is really problematic and of course uh, as i said one thing that's happened is those intermediary structures the 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 structures that enable uh people to actually engage in a genuine conversation not to say that you know reading the new york times is a genuine conversation but the various structures that go into producing uh, a piece of journalism or that goes into uh engaging in a debate in a way where you're accountable for the claims you're making those things are being, I think those things are being degraded and, and, and that then does result in a kind of really uh, uh, kind of crass, um, uh, sort of short-circuited public sphere. And, and, you know, what's worse is that the business models of the platforms that are encouraging this stuff actually require that right because they want more emotional engagement so people will click more onto that platform will click more likes i mean i'm on twitter and i have to say um and this is where i started to think about this whole issue i have to say that i actually learn a lot of good things on twitter the, the, there's people who i follow who who send me to great uh resources and and who are very thoughtful uh twitterati if i can put it that way but there's another side of Twitter, which is just a disaster, um, and that includes many of the thing, kind of phenomena you've mentioned. I mean, you know, I have had some friends who've, who've been um, attacked uh, for things they have written or said on Twitter, and it's been pretty brutal. And, and, you know, that, as you say, that then causes people to step back from public debate. It causes often very thoughtful people to step back from public debate or public engagement. And it, it it's made worse by the fact that increasingly our newspapers and public commentators seem to be driven by social media as well. So we get this loop between um, the two. So I agree with you at least that 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 the this kind of acceleration of uh, of of sort of instant reaction to to uh, an issue or to a to a claim um, it can result in some really problematic behaviors in the public sphere. And I, I think, you know, I, I really do think it's this lack of accountability for the claims that you're making that the social media platforms uh, not just enable, but actually promote. You know, people need to be held accountable for the claims they make in some way. Uh, that's how we judge uh, the extent to which they're being sincere or accurate or trustworthy. And that's, that's really, mm. I think, really problematic. And it cuts both ways, whether you're left or the right, wherever you are politically, uh, you know, um, I think it's it's really problematic. Yeah, I, I think the way we, we t in the past we tend to think of this, the, the, the discipline of making false claims is the, the possibility of others coming in and refuting it. And um, 
But, yeah, the, but the problem you have, to care about, you have to care about wanting to refute something, right? So the problem is, is that often in these in these situations, it's not even clear that people even care about um, assessing the claim that's being. Oh made. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so and, and look, let me say this though. I mean, on the other hand, and and you know, um, there's no question that our media sphere and our public sphere is being transformed in all kinds of extraordinary ways that, that at least I welcome, right? So. One aspect of the Black Lives Matter movement that is so important is that we are actually now seeing voices and, and viewpoints and perspectives that were not welcome before or that were not noticed or, or were not able to kind of penetrate the uh, conventional um, conventional um, debates and the conventional uh, places where uh, discussions and conversations around public issues were happening. And that's important and, and that is a liberating aspect of of new technology but it can also bring with it um some problematic aspects as well hmm. um another aspect uh, or negative that's often referred to of um, the impact of social media on public discourse is the tendency it has to reinforce political polarization so that these algorithms that you've mentioned, um, they're designed to give people what they want. And uh, what they tend to want is to have their existing viewpoints confirmed. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so uh, you end up with a situation where people can live in a, you know, cast sunstone, it refers to them as echo chambers, where they hear nothing but confirmation of their existing viewpoints. Uh, and um, the way the algorithms work, it, it, it's not necessarily even conscious, although, you know, um, you wonder who gets to tweak the algorithms to produce a particular outcome. I'm sure they, they can be tweaked to um, nudge things in, in one direction or the other, but there's just a, a, a dynamic automatically, even apart from that factor that tends to end up with people isolated with their own sources of news, their own sources of information. And, I mean, I noticed this myself, uh, having been involved in politics, uh, that um, within left-wing gatherings, which I you know, was part of the Labor left uh, for decades, and, um, you know, that a certain dynamic would set in at a certain point where uh, everyone's striving to be more lefter than thou. And, uh, and this would often lead debates into truly preposterous directions. Um, but I, I think that's a, that's a very important issue because uh, the ideological sides uh, at the moment just uh, are like ships parting in the night. They simply don't engage. And that seems to be, in part at least, a consequence of the role of social media. Well, look, I mean, like I said, I do think, um, I do think we have to find a way to bring more accountability to the owners of the platforms and to the people who are um, publishing the, the material for the consequences of, of, of what they're doing. I, I do think that's something that is missing. And, and when there's no accountability either for the owner of the platform and there's no accountability for the user to actually participate in good faith in a debate, then I think you've got this terrible uh, loop that gets reinforced in the public culture in all sorts of dramatic ways. Now, if this was just something happening, you know, that people were doing on the weekend or whatever, or, or you know, uh, it didn't have any significant public consequence, and maybe we just think, oh, well, it's just part of living in a free society. But unfortunately, it has really significant consequences for, <laughs> you know, the countries we live in and the world we live in, right? Because these phenomena now are influencing the way politics happens and the way decisions are made. And like I said, there's this feedback loop between um, these phenomena and um, the actual political institutions we um, sort of rely on in, in liberal democracies. And, you know, that's where I think the emerging political science is really interesting, just as a student of, of it, not an expert in it. You know, there are some really dramatic consequences of this. So, so I think, I think this, this crucial connection between um, sort of speech and the intermediary structures we have to enable speech to be meaningful and to able to enable speech to actually be uh, a genuine contribution to a debate 
is something we really have to think about um, both as, you know, as, as people who are interested in the justification of liberal institutions, but also people who, who design them. I think it's a really fundamental challenge. There's no, I, I don't think, you know, technology isn't, you know, there's no, we're not condemned to, to, to see the technology um, um, sort of uh, ruin liberal democracy. I'm not saying that. I, I just think there needs to be some conscious thinking about how we address these these issues. And, um, you know, I, th I think it's a really tough and a, and a much harder and more fundamental challenge than many of the things that people get excited about in, in free speech debates now, frankly. Right. Um, when you talk about the um, infrastructure of public debate, are you referring there to the role of, if you like, gatekeepers, like like the, the traditional editors of newspapers who subject articles to some degree of scrutiny before they're, they're published? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, it, yeah, I, I don't want to... sort of thing you have in mind? Yeah, I mean, broadly, I don't want to romanticise um, romanticize this. By intermediaries, I mean those um, institutions and those frameworks that uh, you know hold us accountable for what we say and the way we say it and mm. of course one of the powerful things about but so sorry, sorry could you, how, how would that form of accountability operate well think about, for example um, the way in which um, a journalist is accountable for the story that they write in a newspaper and if they get the facts wrong or if they get um, if they get the story wrong there's a kind of well, at least until relatively recently, there's a kind of expectation that there would be some, uh, you own that, you're accountable for that. So you, if you get it wrong, then there's some process of correction, there's some process of actually being being held to account. Uh, if you're, a, you know, if you're a, a business that abuses your customers in some way, there's a consumer protection framework that can, the consumer can complain to an agency to say, hey, look, they advertise this thing, but it it isn't what the you know what I thought I was buying. All of that is absent for um, mm. social media companies. They're not, and this is the big debate about whether they should be treated as publishers. Because if then if they're publishers, they're subject to all kinds. Of, that I think is absolutely the correct debate for us to be happening, because that's mm. what's that's what's missing in this case. And and like I said, if it was just if it was something that people were just doing on the weekend that had no real consequence for the broader public culture, then okay, maybe. We don't worry about it, but it clearly is having a broader consequence for the public culture. Now, I'm not saying that the previous existing intermediary, intermediary structures were all great. Um, you know, defamation law has both its vices and its virtues, especially in this country. Uh, you know, um, the, the way the First Amendment gets litigated in the United States is very different than the way it gets litigated, for example, in Canada or in Europe. There are real differences there. But that's missing, almost completely missing, in relation to our um, social media landscape. And, that's and increasingly, increasingly in the, the mainstream media too. One of the yeah. things that I find disturbing is the gradual reduction of uh, comment sections in newspaper, online newspaper articles, where you'd often read an article and the, it might be total rubbish, and you know, it mightn't defame anybody, but it might make a number of claims which are refutable and you'd see it torn to shreds below the line in the comment section and very often the uh, the comment sections are more interesting than the, sure. than the original article and that's a kind of discipline sure. i mean defamation is, is is one form of discipline on people saying something maliciously false about somebody but in terms of making ridiculous claims well, that that was a good a good source of discipline but you know, there's yeah, there's I mean, been a sharp reduction in all that. Yeah, and look, in I, I, times. I guess the thing I worry about is if, if if someone is not interested in having any kind of good faith engagement, right? If someone is literally like those, I mean, it's sort of funny, but it's kind of emblematic of something we're doing. If those, you know, someone says, makes up a story about Trump being endorsed by the Pope um, mm. and, 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 and just has no commitment whatsoever i mean it's sort of funny and okay sure you know we, we people should we there, there's it's important we have room for irony and and satirical uh comments and everything but 
if someone literally has no intention of engaging in good faith debate and these platforms not just not just allow that don't just enable it but as you said kind of you know um put a rocket underneath it sort of mm. viralize it viralize it um then I really wonder. I think the military term is force multiplier. Force multiplier. Then I really wonder whether people should have the right to to engage in those kinds of whether we should give them, you know, extend the privilege of of, of free speech to that kind of speech. And I guess that's that, the that right. doesn't this raise another problem? Uh, what um, somebody or other, I think it's Brian Leiter, who's a professor of jurisprudence at the yeah, University Brian, of Chicago. No um, he, he calls it the neutral epistemic arbiter problem. So, which crops up in all sorts of situations. So, who gets to decide what is true and what is false? Who gets to decide what is a fact and what is not? Who gets to decide what is hateful and what is not? And how do you determine who, who gets to make that uh, choice? What, what we've got at the moment with the social media companies is that um, you're seeing the exercise of, in effect, arbitrary power, because even in the United States, which has the, the strongest constitutional protections in the world against encroachments by the state on freedom of speech, the fact that these are private entities means that they can censor in whatever way they see fit, for whatever reasons they see fit. And, um, uh, you know, in other words, it's a it's a reversion to arbitrary power. And and you might say, well, you know, one typical response is if you don't like what Google does or if you don't like what Twitter does, Twitter does create your own um, social media company. And and there's an, an element of that going on, but it, it's immensely difficult given the, the, the economics of starting these, these things up. Once a, a particular firm has a near monopoly position it, it, it's incredibly difficult to challenge so in effect you've got a bunch of uh, people who with subject to no constraints uh deciding what and uh, you know what viewpoints can and cannot be expressed which yeah. I, I think is a huge problem I and mean, they're, they're having a big you're obviously familiar with the debate in the us over the um, communications decency act where um which is a piece of legislation which exempts the social media companies from being yeah. sued because yeah. of what people post on them. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but the, the, the underlying assumption is that they are mere platforms in the same sense that the telephone yeah. system is a platform. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. so look, on the one hand, this is, a, this is a really serious challenge. On the other hand, as I said, just towards the end of, of my, my remarks, I mean, we, we do have, there are some solutions hand i mean what it comes down to is is um putting um the machines and more importantly the owners of the machines under you know relatively familiar forms of democratic control right i mean they should be subject to the kinds of regulatory frameworks that were so important in in other eras when new forms of technology uh new forms of 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 expression were emerging and you know when films became um more uh sort of widespread and popular we developed all kinds of classification regimes and, and ways of managing that when when the printing press and 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 printed material um became ubiquitous um we developed a whole series of of ways of managing those issues as well so something similar although uh, uh, something different again will be required um, required uh, here. I think you know. To me, that's really the big, uh, and it'll be difficult because these are incredibly powerful organizations, and and they 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 exercise a lot of political power. Um, uh, if you look at the way um, they operate, but but we know what we kind of have solutions to hand. There are things we can do. I mean, I think the really. For me, I guess the thing that it's brought me back to is is some some older debates about, um, you know, um, thinking about issues like free speech in the context of the primacy of the language of rights. Very, very important. It's a very powerful way of expressing the, the underlying value of free speech. But I do think it's for me increasingly we need to think about not just the the the, the rights claim uh, underlying um, the value of free speech. But also the accompanying 
um, duties that follow from that rights claim. And these are not duties that are um, that follow strictly from the the the, the, the claim to free speech. Uh, as I said, they 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 they're they're imperfect or they're indirect. And and I think that is something which is worth us thinking about. And it's difficult because these duties and, and the social norms around them are not necessarily ones that can be easily um, enforced by public mm. authority or through you know, public law or through the, the exercise of the power of the state. But I think they are important aspects of what's gone awry. Now, that isn't to say that um, there was a golden time when people were respectful and civil and life was so much better, not at all. But I do think we learn the value of those aspects of our public sphere um, at a time like this. I think it's something we do have to explore. The focus is so much on the claimant, you know, the right I have to say X, Y, and Z, the right I have to express myself in this way. Um, and I think the final thing I'll say here is I think what makes it even more challenging and interesting for me is that this is happening precisely at a time when I think for me, I welcome it. We're seeing, we're seeing, the, you know, the emergence of, of, of voices that previously were not actually part of the mainstream and that are challenging some of the established voices in the community. And that I welcome that, but it makes, it makes it that much harder as you said as uh, you know as we were talking about earlier okay well we might move to the chat stream um now i think the first actual question in the stream today and we won't get through them all so i apologize in advance um uh, an entity called philosophy and critical thinking there is a real person behind that i can assure you and he's a student of philosophy question given social media algorithms are designed to promote advertising and social media seems to be monopolized is this evidence that such services ought to be moved to public hands? I've had to cheer Google up, I'm sure. Yeah, look, I mean, it's a, that's an argument that's been out there. We should think of, if not in public hands, we should think of at least the underlying platforms as akin to utilities, sort of public utilities, right? Everyone needs to have water and heating and um, you know electricity. So increasingly everyone needs to have, given the way our culture works and the way the, the working world works everyone needs access to the internet um, shouldn't we think of them as public utilities and therefore they should be subject to the kinds of, of regulation that public utilities are subject to right I mean uh, you know the water company has to submit uh, you know to regulatory pricing regimes it has to provide minimal levels of service it's subject to a fair amount of public scrutiny, even even when it's <laughs> been privatized. So I think it's I, I think the logic is yes. Um, we should at least be thinking about the ways in which, given the extraordinary influence and power these companies have, and given the near monopoly conditions in which they operate, whether we should think of them as public more like public utilities. So if 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 not if if nationalizing them or whatever doesn't sort of make sense, and again I'm not an expert in this. Then I think the, the 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 logic is given given their impact, we should think of them as as rather differently, and of course, but, this is something that they are can see in the wind, and they're resisting um, resisting uh, ferociously, especially in, you know in the United States where most of them are based. Yeah, the key uh, regulatory provision surely should be that they be neutral public platforms, not publishers, in other words. Anyway, um, we'd better move on to the next one. Um, Barak Atzman Simon, one may argue that difficult truths are always obfuscated historically using various means. In social media, we can get many diverging responses, no truth, but at least supposedly many perspectives. Yeah, look, excellent point. And I guess I tried to hint at that. Um, you know, you, you can argue that um, Socrates was on to this uh, 2000, or more years ago, when he worried about the the distorting effects of writing, um, that's why he was so concerned about, um, you know, the impact of, of of mediated speech, or at least as reported through Plato. Um, and it's why Plato was so concerned about 
the mediating uh, effect of, of poetry and, and tragedy and drama on the character, uh, the souls of, of the guardians, right? It would, it, would, it would mess them up in all kinds of ways that were problematic. So you're absolutely right. There's always been, there's always been mediation is, is always presented a problem to, to uh, um, society in a whole range of ways. And it's not that the it's not that it's not that we should not that we have to um, uh, avoid it altogether. It's not that there's some fundamental um, problem with it. It's just there are worse and better ways. I think of how we think about the kinds of intermediation we need in order to have a robust public sphere. And and you're right, as I said, um, there's no doubt that the platforms enable new voices to emerge. And the best aspects of, I think, um, social media tend to, to to be in relation to that. And in, even my own personal experience of social media has been that I learn interesting, good stuff from philosophers I follow on Twitter that I would not otherwise have learned. Or uh, I learn about things that I wouldn't otherwise have learned had I not followed that person. But it's kind of Janus faced. And I think the, the challenge we've got is the the, the potential damage that um, these platforms are doing is outweighing um, that early sort of hope for the liberating aspects that social media apparently could bring. I think that to me just seems to be crystal clear now. Optima Analytics, ironically, this very talk wouldn't have been possible That's without right. you through the social medium. That's right. Can one not therefore argue that social media is a neutral technology and the question is about its proper use? Yeah, look, fair, fair, fair enough, and 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 you know, it's a good thing to to push me on the extent to which is it the technology itself that's the problem or the way it's used. And I think um, obviously there's some truth in 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 the technology being able to be used for good. As I said, you know, I mean, if we think about, for example, the algorithms that radiographers are are now using, and I know this because we. We're doing at the University of Sydney. I mean, the advances in in the detection of, of breast cancer for is just being transformed because of the technology. It's extraordinary, and it's being put to transformational good use. Having said that, and again, I'm not an expert on it. And this is why I've been dipping into this literature. There is something about the anonymized nature of the platforms and the way in which people interact with them that drives the business model that is a is a, is a direct feature of the technology itself that is really, I think, problematic. But as I said, maybe there are ways uh, we can subject um, those aspects of the technology to more um, democratic reform, that we can actually um, position them in such a way that um, they are actually contributing to a robust public sphere rather than undermining it, as I think they probably are now. Tony Zara Newman, social media offers a TV reality show. The more shocking the statements, the less we connect dots between statements. This is addictive, yep. hungering another shock, discarding thought. So I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't read deeply in the literature, but um, there is some extraordinary. You can, if you Google science 2018 um, uh, falsehoods. Um, You'll, you'll probably get the article, or I can send you the article if you're interested, the link. Mm -hmm. um, so this work has, and much other work has shown that um, we are, uh, the more we're exposed to often completely false claims, Trump endorses, Pope endorses, the, or actually, Trump endorses the Pope, it'd be more interesting, but Pope endorses the Trump, endorses Trump. The more we're exposed to that, it, apparently the, the, the sheer novelty of, of, of the story um, embeds it in our various cognitive um, processes in a way that, you know, careful fact checking and denials of those kinds of things struggles to, to, to work its way in. So, so, um, so I think, you know, I think, I think the novel value of deeply crazily wrong and, and look at Trump's whole birtherism stuff about Obama um, when he was, uh, before he was a candidate, an outright racist lie. And yet it was circulating in social media and circulating in the public sphere to the extent where 
the mainstream media started reporting on it. Um, that's just another example of how these things just lodge themselves in the cognitive structure of the public sphere, and they're very hard to dislodge. Okay, Hugh Wyndham, there's too much tribalism. If you belong to a certain tribe, you believe or accept certain ideas and cannot accept or even rationally debate any other. Well, that yeah, I mean, I guess this, this is something that, and this is not an original um, argument. I mean, for a while now, and... and um, um, Peter mentioned Cass Sunstein in one of Cass Sunstein's early books on the internet and democracy. This was a big um, theme of his work that uh, without intervention, um, social media tends to provide mechanisms for reinforcing um, your beliefs without challenge. It's a version of Peter's left wing uh, labor left meetings where the comrades are repeatedly trying to out outdo each other in their in their commitment to the creed and i think that happens in a kind of turbocharged way uh mm -hmm. in various internet uh, forums and that's just bad for our public culture in general dale turner has social media exposed that the pursuit of political economic power is incompatible with truth no um yeah good question um I think I think it demonstrates that unregulated by democratic forms of control yes but I don't think it demonstrates that um you know it's impossible to uh be committed to a to a a public sphere broadly conceived that in which people are in good faith trying to arrive at the right answer to questions that need to be answered that are unavoidable. I don't think it demonstrates that that's impossible. I just think it demonstrates that when you have a very powerful set of unregulated, unaccountable companies um, with such a with such a uh, outsized influence on the public culture um it puts enormous pressure on um some of the underlying fundamental norms that make some of our liberal classic liberal democratic rights um meaningful in the first place that's a good question uh barrack Atzman simon i take it you would agree with McLuhan's assertion from 1964 that the medium is the message <laughs> I.e. it is the form of communication, e.g. mass publicity, that informs its content limits, decorum, etc. Yeah, look, I'm not, I don't know enough about McLuhan to really comment on that. I mean, I think, uh, uh, like I said, I think, I think what worries me about um, the sort of way in which uh, the kind of speech that is encouraged and and um, enabled through these platforms means that it's increasingly disconnected from any commitment to its truth claim or its even its plausibility, let alone anything um, more than that. So that's, I think, um, my concern. And he's Aaron Newman. Technology may well be a problem in itself, but we have misunderstood the way people naturally use it. Think of totally open meeting places, open to virtually all as churches and private schools. Yeah, look, I mean, I'll take that as a kind of comment. I mean, I, I like I said, I think it's a it's a good question to ask whether there is something inherently um, anti democratic or anti. Um, liberal in the nature of the technology itself I, I don't think i i don't think that is the case but there is as i said as i'm coming to understand it there is something quite um powerful in 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 this case in the wrong way about the way the anonymized nature of these platforms work that is that is really worrying and that any response to it will have to will have to tackle but you, you could be right it could be that you know this technology is eminently 
re-pointable um, in, a, in, a um, in a positive direction. Anthony Carr, Duncan Iverson raises what may be called a who whom question, who regulates and restricts, to whom must regulation and restriction be applied? Well, like I said, I have- Who fact checks to fact checkers? Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Like I said, I think I think we have, although the although the situation and context is different, we have we have tools and 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 uh, mechanisms and institutions we can draw on, right? I mean, we've ex exerting some kind of democratic control over these um, over these entities, over these um, uh, this domain of the economy is something we've done in other contexts. Uh, and in some cases, very effectively. So I, I don't see there's any there's any problem there. And at the end of the day, if you're if you're a liberal democrat, you, you think ultimately um, uh, you want um, the, the, the the demos is is um, uh, the one to whom these um, uh, companies and these processes should be ultimately accountable. But the exact way in which you do that is a, raises a whole series of other other questions. Okay, thinking Peter. Many politicians use Twitter, but there is very little moderation of the comments. So how can we make social media a better experience? Yeah, like okay. I said, I'm not, a, yeah, I, I'm, I'm no, not an expert. I just think that's the kind of question we should be asking more systematically, um, rather than rather than simply thinking what we've got now is, is acceptable. Um, you know, drawing on my own experience, the difference between a, a, a Twitter, for example, that is productive and interesting and useful lies almost entirely in the way in which the individual uh, engages on Twitter. They're sharing information. They're providing evidence for what they're saying. They're, they're connecting you with further um, advice or further um, information um, they're not a, they're not spending their time abusing others they're, they're, they're not sort of seeking the kind of emotional thrill of of, of, of sort of random um, online um, abuse so I think you know ultimately it's going to be a combination of, of changing the way the platforms work and and the accountability of those companies to that um, framework and secondly, um, the, the social norms that uh, people uh, actually practice when they engage with each other. Bruce Nolling, freedom of speech seems to have two factors that bear on the pursuit of truth. One is the presentation of ideas, the second is the level of respect employed in the language used. They conflict. They can, they can conflict, no doubt about it, because sometimes um, difficult issues uh, generate uh, all kinds of social and cognitive dissonance and discomfort. Um, you know, it was unpleasant for, you know, I'm just reading the, uh, um, the magnificent uh, biography of Martin Luther King um, by Taylor Branch. I highly recommend it. It's three volume massive series, but it's well worth your time. I mean, you know, uh, Martin Luther King made uh, um, made Americans very, very uncomfortable and often very angry because he was challenging deeply rooted, systematic, violent racism. And yeah, truth can be uncomfortable and painful, um, but there are um, there's a sense in which the way in which you pursue those debates and pursue those arguments, and King is a master example of that. I mean, here, here's someone who drew both on the prophetic tradition of his church and on this kind of Jeffersonian American um, tradition as well. You combine those two languages. Um, you know, the way in which you conduct those arguments is, is critically important. That's where the, the social norms around the expression of, of, of speech are so, is so important. Botsmer Analytics, your claim regarding anonymity of the messenger is about social media being in private hands. Wouldn't the problem become worse if social media was in the public hands of increasingly authoritarian regimes? Yeah, look, fair point. And, and as I said, um, you know, the Oxford Institute 
for the internet has done this really uh, fascinating study where where they've demonstrated um, how many governments around the world, both liberal, democratic, and authoritarian, are actively um, um, seizing the the means of uh, social media production, if I could put it that way. And yeah, it is a risk. Absolutely, is a risk. And that's why, as I said, you want to see democratic control exerted over these um, these 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 um, platforms, not um, simply unvarnished uh, state control. And so that it comes then with all the things we would expect uh, uh, when we talk about democratic control. Okay. Barking Madeline. Prior to Facebook, I don't think that's a typo. We had internet chat forums where people could register on a number of different ones according to their interests and discuss, share info, ask questions. People were more respectful. Yeah, look, it's interesting. Someone else, I think, on the on the chat I saw briefly was sort of saying, are you saying the early days of the internet were better? I don't know. I mean, um, look, I just think I'll go back to, to my earlier point that, you know, the... The, the way in which you 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 interact and the way in which you um, behave in in the public sphere, whether that's a digital public sphere or a physical public sphere, are shaped by the accompanying social norms that um, inform um, those interactions. And um, I, I guess my concern is that those are the things that seem to be breaking down or under pressure in a in in in, in our social media age and it and but it could be that um and maybe this is what you're asking and this goes back to the earlier question which is is useful for me to think about it could be that there are different you know technological forms that are better or worse for promoting or supporting certain kinds of of, of social norms and yeah maybe that's something worth thinking about Okay, well, we've uh, reached our closing time. Um, so apologies, as usual, to all the uh, comments and queries we didn't get to. Um, we might be able to continue on, on our own website later on. Um, Duncan, do you have any concluding uh, observations? No, no, thank you very much. It's been really helpful and really enjoyable conversation, as always, with the Blackheath um, um, community. So many thanks again, Peter, for the invitation. And like I said, it's something i've just really been starting to 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 think more about over the past little while so it's it's great to be able to try out some of these ideas and get some feedback from a terrific um terrific philosophical uh community okay well thank you very much thanks to all our audience and all our posters and especially thanks to duncan and with that i'll end the broadcast thanks everyone